have to remember where we came from. Amen. So part of the reason I'm here, um, and I'm going to talk about obedience this morning. I'm going to talk about overcoming fear. Um, obedience is a tough one. It, it, it's, uh, but obedience is also the reason that I'm here today, because I've, I've listened to God. I've stepped out, and, and I've done that, which has called me to do to position um, myself for what God has for me. This pulpit, something has changed since last week. I think he shined it, or he lacquered it. Um, polyurethane it. But it is a nice, nice pulpit. Amen. I can spread out. I can put all four of my papers in different <laughs> locations. I got my water. So let, let's get into it. Obedience in any form is a sign of surrender. It's a sign of a humble heart. Obedience is tough, right? Being obedient to God is, is one of the hardest things I've ever had to do. We are going to dismiss the children. <laughs> Thank you, David. I gotta, I gotta remember to look over here for more cues during the service. Like you're going too late, you know, you're sweating from your armpits, keep them down, you know, things like that. So, obedience is very challenging. Being obedient to what God has called you to do. I think it's the thing that I've struggled with the most of my life was being obedient. Was um, not just following God, but but following what He's telling me to do. And my my advancement in life or my lack of advancement had a direct correlation to my obedience. And I don't know how many times God can put his finger on something in my life. And I'm like, I don't want to deal with that. You know, I don't, I don't, want, to, I don't want to give you that part of me. You know, I don't want to do that. I don't want to step out of my comfort zone. And so I stayed in that place where, um, you know, I looked like I was a good Christian. I would go to church and, you know, I was a good father and a good husband. But I, but I knew that, that God was putting his finger on something that I wasn't willing to give him. Um, that I wasn't being obedient. And so... Um, as much as obedience and, or lack of obedience has kept me stuck, um, obedience has been that thing that, that has got me unstuck, that has positioned me for what God has for my life. So I want to talk about obedience. Obedience is, is dying to yourself, right? It, it's dying to that thing. To be obedient to God, really, the, 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 on the contrary, it's dying to what I want. Most of the time, it's, it's that, like, God's asking me to do that. It's like, God, and it's a dying to my will. It's a dying to my flesh. It's a dying to, to those things that, that I want. And so obedience is dying to yourself. Some of the, the greatest miracles, some of the greatest advancements and victories that I've had in my life have, have come on the other, other side of obedience. And, and God has blessed me with a beautiful wife. You know, we've been married 15 years. I have two adopted children. Um, I, I currently own a sober house. Um, and, I, and I help men struggling with addiction. I did foster care for a while, and that was a tough one, being obedient to that. My wife wanted to do it. I wasn't really on board, and, and I finally agreed to it. I said, okay, God, if this is what you have for us, we'll do it. It's hard to open up your home to a teenage um, a teenage girl, nonetheless, and, um, and and just kind of give up your own space and your own freedom. But uh, it, it was an act of obedience, and, and that, that girl... Um, turned her life around. There was a moment six, six, seven months in with her that, you know, I was ready to give up. And, and I, it was justified to give up. God, I, you know, I have all the reasons to give up. She's not doing, I had to bail her out of jail. I had to do this. I had to do that. And, and I'm justified in giving up on her. You know, she's not following the rules. She's not doing what she should be doing. And, and there's a lot of times we can be justified with things in our life, but that doesn't mean that that's what God's called us to do. I can justify things so I'm blue in the face. That doesn't make the right decision. And so we were at a bypass with her, and, and, and we sought the Lord, and we sat her down and said, hey, you know, th this is this is our expectations. This is what needs to happen, and or you're going to leave. And, and it, it was the moment that she needed to change her life, because three months later, she's on the honor roll. Six months after that, she's graduating from high school. And to go and watch her graduate, and to be a, a parent to her um, what was a life-changing event. But, but it happened in, through obedience. It, it happened through saying, okay, God, I'll do this. Uh, I, I'm willing. Usually usually obedience is a test of our willingness, right? When when Abraham went, uh, God tested Abraham. He said, take your son. You know, they believed for a son. They got their son. And, and God told him, go sacrifice your son. Take him, take him up the mountain. And sometimes... Um, Obedience is, is really a test of our willingness. Obedience is a test of, uh, am, am I willing to sacrifice? Am I willing to be to do that which God is calling me to do? And so God tests Abraham. 
he takes his son up there and to sacrifice him, and, and God stops him. But, but usually God will test our willingness, whether we're willing to do that which he's called us to do, willing to sacrifice, willing to, to lay down our lives. My wife, if you've never done public speaking before, you get very dry in your mouth when you speak it. So my wife, this was probably about six months ago, God told her, you know, it was like, before she's going to bed, I'm, I'm, I'm going to wake you up in the middle of the night, and I want you to pray. She's like, all right, God, you know, whatever, I'll, 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 when you wake me up, I'll pray. So God wakes her up in the middle of the night. My wife's one of them that gets up two, three, four times in the night and goes to the bathroom and comes back and whatever. This is the first time that, that God had woke her up that night. And uh, she rolls over, and she says, you know, I really don't want to pray right now. And so she tests, she tests God. She said, okay, if it's 3.33, I will, I will get up and pray. She rolls over, grabs her phone. 3.33 on the dot. She hadn't looked at her phone at 1.30. She didn't have any idea what the roundabout time it was. And so she's like, oh, but she got up really fast and, and went downstairs. And, and a lot of times God tests our willingness. He, he tests whether we're willing to, to, to get up in the middle of the night and pray. He tests... Whether, whether we will do that thing that he's asking us to do. So obedience is a test of our willingness. Sometimes I find with obedience, um, I have the nature to not ask God what he wants me to do. Because once I know, then there's a responsibility, right? And, and we see this all the time in recovery. A lot of times there, guys don't, there's not an awareness of, of me being the problem. Uh, if I don't know that I'm the problem, that I can't, that I'm gonna fix myself, right? And so it's the same thing with obedience. If I don't know what God's telling me to do, that, then I don't have to do it. So sometimes I don't even want to ask because that's, once I know, then then I have a responsibility. And so obedience is tricky to where we have to be willing to ask, and and that's the hard part with there being an awareness when it, when there there was once a time in my life where I wasn't aware that I was the problem. I think one of the hardest things I've had to do in my life is to look in the mirror and say, I am the problem. It's, it's not this person's fault. And part of the problem in life is there's a lot of really good justifications. I work with guys that have been abused, that were sexually abused, that didn't have parents, that had a raw deal. And, and there's a good justification in that. You know, when it, it's my dad's fault. It, it's, it, it's the abuse's fault. It, it's, it, it's this fault. There's a very good justification in life, but that doesn't serve you know, we, we can make excuses, we can blame things, but it doesn't serve you. You have the right to, to do whatever you want, right? I have the right to this, I have the right to that. We want to plead our rights. You have the right to not walk in forgiveness. It's easy to not walk in forgiveness when someone's hurt us, right? But it doesn't serve us. And so we have to be careful to not hold on to our rights because they don't serve us. And, and um, I, I know that I need to walk in forgiveness. It's, it's a key for me. So... Or we, we bargain with God. You ever bargain with your obedience? You knew God you knew, you knew God was telling you to do something. And you're like, yeah, well, how about I do it this way? How about I like get one foot in? Or I do it this way? Or, or part of my problem with obedience is a couple of years ago, God, I, I was working at, go, had the opportunity to go to Hope Haven and to minister to guys in, um, in a rehab facility. This was a state-run facility. And so it was a big deal to go up there. I was invited up there to give them Jesus. I want you to come up and give them Jesus. You're not, you're not even allowed to do that in the state-run facility. You know, they call it spirituality. And so I had this opportunity to go up there and, and do that. And um, so through that opportunity, you know, I, I, I want to I bargain with God. You know, I want to I wanna kind of negotiate with him what he's called me to do. And so through that opportunity, I bought a sober house. And, and, and in that, you know, I, okay, God, you called me to do this. I'm going to be obedient. I'm going to do this. And, and after the fact, okay, this is hard. This is one of the hardest things that I've ever done. And I think you know, I'm going to live my dream. I'm going to buy the sober house. I'm going to help guys. And, and little did I realize how hard it would be, how hard it would be. And, and thank, thank God that we don't get the whole picture, right? If God gave us the whole picture, you know, okay, God. I want to see it. I want to know the whole picture. What's it going to be the end game? You know, what's going to be the bottom line financially? 
what's going to be this. I think God just protects us from the whole picture. Because the whole picture, I never would, I never would have been obedient. And, and sometimes we have, to, we have to step out in faith. Not knowing it all. Not knowing what God has called me. Then, you know, all those details that we want to know. Because I, I bought a sober house. I opened it up three weeks before COVID hit. Now, now everything's shut down. And now I have to... Um, you know, the, the, the help I had lost, now my kids are home from school, and now I'm a teacher, and now I have a sober house, and I can't be there, and I can't do what God, thank God he, he protected me from that, right? Amen. Because that would have been a, a big trouble. I would, I would have, you know, but, but we, we bargained with God. And so after the fact, you know, okay, okay, God, is this still something you want me to do? And there's sometimes there's seasons in life where God's called us to do something, and it was seasonal, Right? And it was a season of my life. God's called me to do this. And so it's not a bad thing to ask God, you know, if this is something you're still calling me to do. Um, are you still calling me to help God? So are you still at calling me to, to, to keep this house going? And so this is a question I've, I've tried to weasel my way through sometimes. And, and, and you know, I've told God many times, I'm good. I, I can sell this house tomorrow and be fine with it. And, and so I've had to struggle through obedience. Okay, God told me to do something. And now i got to continue to do it. And so I went through this moment uh, about a month ago with, with the house and just really reevaluating what I'm doing. And, and in the process, um, it's been hard because I'm only one person. I can only do so much. And, and what uh, I'm able to give the guys of what they need is maybe 40, 50% of what they need. And so it, it's, it's far from perfect. I've had to die to myself because I want it done. Excellent. I want perfection. I want to do, you know, and I've had to lay that down, and I've had to learn some lessons in the process. It's okay. To, it's okay that it's just okay. It's okay to struggle. It's okay um, that that it's not perfect. You know, God had to deal with me last year about about a lot of these issues, about wanting in a certain way, and so, you know, a few weeks ago I'm struggling, and I'm, I'm revisiting this with God. God, is this something you still want me to do? This you still want me to do this, and and and. And a lot of times, God will give me confirmation. He'll, he'll let me know exactly what I'm doing. And, and, and so what I'm doing, you know, it's a little broken because I don't have the help I need. And so I, I told God, I said, God, I will not move forward. I will not do this anymore unless I have help. I'm not going to do it anymore because it, 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 it's not, it can't work. It's not going to work. You know, it, it, it's broken in a way. And so without um, having talked to my father, father lives in Virginia currently, and, and, and we hadn't talked during this process, and a couple weeks later, I get a phone call, and he said, I'm going to quit my job, and I'm going to move up there, and I'm going to help you with the bridge. I said, okay, Lord. Yeah. And, and, and sometimes, you know, that's not enough, right? You know, God, I need more confirmation than that. <laughs> and so there's this day I'm struggling, and, and I, get, I get a message from Christine. You know, and, it was, and, 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 and she just heard from God. She heard his voice, and she texted me. I don't even remember the text, but it's exactly what I needed in that moment. And um, what else had happened? In the same day, I get a text message from somebody. He didn't tell me his name, but he, he texted me, and he was somebody from Holy. He said, thank you. Um, you saved my life. Thank you for helping me. And so, um, and, and then struggling with being obedient, God reminded me why I'm doing what I'm doing. And it doesn't have to be perfect. I don't have to have it all figured out. Um, and, and it's okay to wrestle. It's okay to wrestle with yourself. It's okay to wrestle with your obedience. It, it's okay. But but God is calling us to be obedient. So. Amen. 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 One of the things I've had to learn, and this happened um, in going to Hope Haven, and, and this is the second or third time I was going up there. It's since 2019. And I'm fresh. I'm still afraid of public speaking, and I'm still getting me, my nerves underneath me. And I'm standing in my front hallway, and, and God tells me, "I want you to do a salvation message today. I want you to to, to open it up at the end for them to receive Christ." And, and I wrestled with that. You know, I, I, God, this is I'm not even comfortable yet. You know, I, I, I'm, not, I'm not even good at speaking up there. And, and I wrestled with him, and I hear God speak to me, and this changed my life. That this principle has changed my life since. And God spoke to me and he said, it doesn't matter if one person gives their life to the Lord. Your value is based in your obedience. Yeah. That's it. That's it. And so our reward structure is based on results, right? 
We judge everything based on results. Oh, there was 3,000 people here. That must mean there was good results. There was all these salvations. What if there was 500 people that showed up? What if there was two salvations? What if that one salvation was a Billy Graham? But, but we want to judge the end results. We want to judge numbers. And it's just the way we're wired. You know, we want, we want to judge by how much money we make, by, by, uh, by, by many different categories. And so God had, God had dealt with me in that, that it doesn't matter if one person gives their life to the Lord. Who are you to judge a seed? I'm like, wow. And, and that really changed my perspective on what my reward structure needs to be. Your reward structure needs to be solely based on obedience. It doesn't matter what the end result is. And so I've had to learn to surrender the results. Surrender the results. My, 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 what God values is obedience. And so I get up there, and, and I'm obedient to the Lord. And, and I had a room full of people. I had 12, 13 people in there, and a counselor was in there because he was, you know, he was checking up on me. You know, it was my second or third time there. He wanted to make sure I wasn't, you know, a cuckoo or whatever. And, and so I get to the end, and I open him up. I said, I, you know, I want to open this up today, whoever um, wants to receive Jesus into their life and into their heart. And, um, and I said, I just want you to stand up. I didn't even do the hand raise. I didn't even do the hand raise, close your eyes, you know, don't look at your people around you. Um, I, I did, I want you to stand up. So, so the whole room stands up. All 12 people in the room and the counselor stood up. Woo! <laughs> But I learned that in that process, it didn't matter if one person stood up. Who am I to judge a seed? What if that would have been a seed for the next time they were asked right. for that? And, and I think Alan will confirm this. It takes seven times for, for someone to receive Christ, to, to remember something, for it to take. <laughs> and, and I think it works that way um, with, with, with the Lord as well. It takes some, some time sometimes. So um, surrender the results. Uh, don't judge the outcome. Let's look at the scripture and what and what the Lord says about obedience. In 2 John 5, 6, I think Molly's going to get it up there for us so we can follow along. 2 John 5, 6 says, And now, dear lady, I'm not writing to you a new command, but one we have had from the beginning. I ask that we love one another. And this is love, that we walk in obedience to his commands. So the scripture here is equating obedience to love. And this is love. That we walk in obedience to his commands. So, so it, it's telling us that, that, that love is obedience and obedience uh, and love is obeying his commands, right? Amen. And then it goes on to say, as you have heard from the beginning, his command is that you walk in love. So his command is to be obedient, uh, to be obedient to his commands, right? And, and the command is to walk in love. And so love is the single most important principle that God has called us to walk into. Amen. God is love. I had a guy ask me once, he said, well, how can you describe God? And, and without thinking about it, I said, God is love. You know, it, it's, there's actually a scripture that says God is love, right? God is love. And, and so God, the essence, the very nature of God is love. Amen. So if we're to follow his commands, if obedience equals following his commands, if his commands equate to love. Uh, the, the first and greatest commandment in Matthew 22, 37 is to love the Lord God with all your heart, soul, and mind. And so to obey the, the most important commandment, Jesus said, is to love. It's to love the Lord God with all your heart, soul, and mind. The second is to love your neighbor and yourself. Sometimes I get that out of balance. You know, I try to love guys. I try to love uh, my wife. I try to love people um, first before I love God. And, and, and it gets out of balance, right? When, when I'm not putting God first, when I'm not seeking Him first, when I, when I haven't loved God with all my heart, it's hard for me to love individuals with all my heart, right? It's hard for me to, to be that which has God called me to be. So that's why that is first, because there's a balance to things. So God is a love. John 13, 35 says, By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples, if you love one another. Another version says, your love for one another will prove to the world that you are my disciples. Here, here we go. So he's saying that what's going to separate you is love. He had, he, Jesus, Jesus was thinking, you know, what's the one single thing that will separate you? It wasn't money. 
It wasn't kindness. It wasn't compassion. What is the world bankrupt of? What is the world, what's the one single thing that will set you apart? What is the one single quality that the world will look at and, 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 and know that you're my disciples? Jesus picked love, that you love one another. They will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. Yes, amen. The most important principle is love. If, if we don't love one another, we missed it. We missed it. You, you are bankrupt without love. And it's something that God has had to teach me and train me. And, and so much to the point where I've had to learn to love my enemies. Jesus taught, love your enemies. Pray for those who spitefully do you wrong. That's a tough one, right? It's hard to love your enemies. See, the scripture says it's easy to love those who are easy to love. Even the taxpayer loves those who, you know, pay their taxes. It's hard to love those who do you wrong. But I've had to, even recently, I've had to go to bed. The, the, the scripture says, do not let the, the sun go down. The movie, the sun go down in your anger. Is that it? Yeah. I always flip it around and let the anger go down in your sun. But I had it right <laughs> the first time. Um, and, and so I've had to, to apply that principle to my life. Because when you go to bed angry, guess what? You're going to wake up angry. Yeah. When you go to bed thinking about someone that hurts you, guess what? You're going to wake up thinking about the same thing that hurts you. And so I've had to, I've had to apply that principle to my life that, that I'm going to choose to love people that have hurt me. I'm going to choose to pray for them. And, 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 and I'll catch myself thinking about that hurt, thinking about how someone hurt me. And I'm laying in bed. And, and I instantly, okay, Lord, I'm going, to, I'm going to pray for them. I'm going to apply that. I'm going to love them. And when I start praying for them, you wouldn't believe how quick I fall asleep. When I'm stewing about that thing, and I'm thinking about that hurt, man, you, 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 you're tossing and turning for hours. And so God has called us not just to love one another. Love for our brothers doesn't just uh, separate us. When we love our enemies, that also separates us. When, 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 when people see you loving them, even though they hurt you, that it's very important. So, love. If you keep, John 15, 10 says, if you keep my commands, you will remain in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commands and remain in his love. So obedience. Obedience is a challenge, okay? Not just to God, but to leaders. It's something that God has had to teach me to be obedient. And, and a lot of times we have, like, this much information, and we want to judge um, what someone tells us to do. Or, 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 or we, we see surface level, and, and we want to judge it. And, and so, like, in a t think about war. Think about people that are on the front lines, that are out there um, in combat. And, and you've got the generals kind of behind the scenes. They can see everything. They have the maps. They have, they have the computer models. They have, they have the plans for war. They have the strategies. And, and people that have been in, um, in the military understand this principle. They just follow the orders. They, they don't got to worry about, um, you know, they don't have to worry about it. They just have to obey the commands. And so we, we struggle as humans to obey our leaders, to be, obey our pastors, to obey people above us because we have, we have our, you know, we have our position. You know, I'm on the front lines. I see what's happening. And, you know, we should go this way. Well, you don't see the aerial view of what's going on. And so we, we make judgments based on very little information. And, and we want to take a stand. No, this is wrong. Well, you, you know 10% of the actual issue. So um, I've had to learn to um, just be obedient. I think it's something that, that, that God even was working out in me during the, the events and during the leadership summit and during the, uh, the tent meetings. And we had a, a leadership summit here. And, you know, we got the registrations 150 a day. They're going up. They're, you know, it was like 50 a day. They're going up 50 a day. We got 1,000 people registered. And we're taking chairs down. We're taking tables down. I'm like, this is, I, I, I can't even understand this. this doesn't even, right? How are we taking chairs down? And, and, and I had to get to a point where it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what I, what I think. Now, the hardest thing in life is to keep your heart right. The hardest thing in life is to keep your heart right. It really is. And, and to, 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 to be able to be in a situation to keep your heart right. It's not about whether you're right or wrong. Because you make yourself out just as wrong by taking up your case, taking up your cause. And, I'm, you know, I'm right. Darn it. I'm right. And, and so it's hard to be obedient. And so even with the, the, the tent meetings, you know, it's hot in the tent, right? It was hot. People are coming up. It's hot in here. We're sweating. You know, you can open up sides. It doesn't matter when I open up. It, it's not up to me to open the sides. And so I had a real peace about, I just had to follow my 
I just had to be obedient to, to orders. And, and, and we need to take on that attribute as, as, as servant to God. We need to be obedient to our pastors. We need to, and just let it go. There's such a peace in letting it go. There's such a peace in not being right. It doesn't matter if you're right. If, 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 I, if I let my heart get wrong, then I'm wrong. Right. And so we, we have to protect your heart. The hardest thing in life is to protect your heart. To protect your heart. Am I doing all right? So obedience requires hearing. Romans 10, 11 says, So let then faith come by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. So obedience requires hearing, and hearing by the word of God. Both, both obedience, okay, it says faith uh, requires hearing. It requires hearing through the word of God. So we, you, have, you have, on one aspect, the greatest enemy of obedience is fear. Fear, if you're honest with yourself, fear is the reason that you haven't been obedient. Fear is the thing that the enemy always will use to keep you from it. That's fear and intimidation, and he wants to make you afraid. And we're going to get into some different aspects of fear here in a little bit. But fear, a lot of times, is the enemy's number one tool. What do you think with, uh, with COVID-19? Number one, number one tool was fear. Fear, 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 making people afraid, making people afraid, making people afraid. There was people that were so afraid that it didn't, didn't line up with, with reality. It didn't line up with, with what was happening. I'm not, just, I'm not discounting, I'm not saying it's not real, but it didn't, it didn't match up to what was happening. People were really afraid. And so the enemy will always try to make us afraid. And so we have faith, hearing through the word of God. To, 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 to gain faith, you have to hear. To be obedient, you have to hear. You have to listen to the word. And so fear also comes the same way. Fear and faith are both delivered through, through hearing. Um, and what we listen to, what we give our attention to, will rule our lives. And so if I give myself over to fear, if I sit in front of the news night after night and I listen to the fear and the, the agenda and, and them you know, trying to make me afraid, and if I listen to that voice, that thing's going to win in my life. But if I listen to God and what he has called, that, that thing is going to win in my life. So whatever, so whatever I put my focus on is going gonna, is gonna to win. And if I'm looking to discredit something, I'm going to find enough evidence to discredit something. If I'm looking to, to give something credit, if I'm looking to, to, to prove that God is real, I'm going to find the evidence. If you're an atheist and looking to disprove God, you're going to find the evidence that you're looking for. And so whatever I focus on is going to win in my life. Whatever I give my attention to. It, it is going to win. It, it, am I giving my attention to the fear? Or, or, or am I stepping out of faith? Am I doing that which God has called me to do? So, I want to talk about a story here in 1 Samuel 15 um, about King Saul. Um, but, but faith, see, faith doesn't, my faith doesn't imply that, that there's no longer fear. Because because I move forward um, with having fear in my life. A lot of times we think that, that faith is the absence of fear. My faith just means that despite there being fear, I'm going to move forward, right? So so my faith implies that, okay, I can still, you know, not that I'm, I'm giving myself over to fear, but I've been afraid to move forward. I've been afraid to take some steps. And so if you want to overcome fear in your life, you have to do the thing that you're afraid of. If I'm afraid of public speaking, how am I going to overcome public speaking? <coughs> fear. I'm going to do public speaking. If I'm, if I'm afraid of heights, you know, what's the best way to overcome some of those things? To put yourself in that position to overcome that fear. And so, amen. <laughs> All right, I'll take it. I'm not getting a lot out of here, so I'll take it. You're supposed to be my number one over there. <laughs> So we're going to go into 1 Samuel. No, maybe it's 2 Samuel. Maybe I wrote that down wrong. No, I didn't. I didn't. 1 Samuel 15. We pick up the story here where Saul, it was given specific instructions on what to do, on how to, how to, how to operate, how to move forward. Uh, Saul was being challenged man, to be obedient to the instructions. And so in verse We'll pick it up in verse 13. When Samuel reached Saul, Saul said, The Lord bless you. 
I have carried out the Lord's instructions. And so Saul was really quick to like, you know, prove, I, man, I carried out. So there, you know, I'm sure he was worried. He saw Samuel coming in the distance. And you don't want the prophet to show up. In the Old Testament, you didn't want the prophet to show up. You know, it wasn't like a good sign. He, you know, he, he knew when he saw him that he had to defend himself. So right out the gate, he's defending himself. He's like, oh man, the prophet's here. It's not good. He's like, man, I followed the Lord's instructions. But Samuel said, what then is the bleeding of sheep in my ears? What is the lowing of cattle that I hear? Saul answered, the soldiers brought them from the Amalekites. They spared the best of the sheep and cattle to sacrifice to the Lord your God. But we totally destroyed the rest. I like that. It's like, we totally, but we totally destroyed the rest. You know, the ones that we, we saved the best and we sacrificed it for the Lord. We totally killed the rest. We didn't keep any of it. You know, we don't got any gold underneath our pillows, underneath our, you know, underneath our tents. We got rid of it all. And so Samuel says, first, stop, 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 stop. My son, when he was three, two, three years old, he used to say to Ray, stop, 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 stop. I just, I kind of heard this and that, 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 that Samuel says, stop, stop, I don't want to hear it. I don't want to hear your lame excuse. I don't want to hear it. He says, he says, stop. Samuel said to Saul, let me tell you what the Lord said to me last night. Tell me, Saul replied. Samuel said, although you were once small in your own eyes, did you not become the head of the tribes of Israel? The Lord anointed you king over Israel, and he sent you on a mission, saying, go and completely destroy those Wicked people, the Amalekites, make war on them until you have wiped them out. Why did you not obey the Lord? Why did you pounce on the plunder and do evil in the eyes of the Lord? But I did obey the Lord, Saul said. I went on the mission. The Lord assigned me. I completely destroyed the Amalekites and brought back Agog, their king. The soldiers took sheep and cattle from plunder. The best of what was devoted to God in order to sacrifice them to the Lord your God at Gilgal. But Samuel replied, does the Lord delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices so as much as in obeying the voice of the Lord? To obey is better than a sacrifice. So we've all heard that one, right? Obedience is better than a sacrifice. This is the backstory to that, to that verse. Uh, he, he thought he was you know, doing a, a solid by sacrificing to the Lord. That wasn't the instructions. Obedience is better than sacrifice. And to heed is better than to is better than the fat of rams. For rebellion is like the sin of divi divination, and arrogance like the evil of idolatry. Because you have rejected the word of the Lord, he has rejected you as king. And that must have been a painful thing to hear, that, that, that I have been rejected as king, because he wanted to do it his own way. He wanted to sacrifice. He, he didn't want to be obedient to the instructions. And, and, and maybe the instructions didn't make sense to him. You know, these are the instructions. I'm going to kill the best of calves, or I'm going to I'm going to get rid of everything, even the best plunder, even the gold and all. This is the stuff that they they went to war for, was to get the the goods and the plunder and the cattle, and that was the reward. God wanted to destroy it all. That doesn't make sense. I don't know how many times I've said that. No, that doesn't make sense. That doesn't make sense. You know, that doesn't seem like the right choice. And, and, and I made my own decision. I made my own decisions on what I thought was right. Not, not based on what God thought was right. Not based on the instruction that God was giving you. So then Saul said to Samuel, I have sinned. I violated the Lord's command and your instructions. I was afraid of the people, and so I gave in to them. Now I beg you, forgive my sin and come back to me so that I may worship the Lord. So here comes the truth. He, he, he finally is open and honest. You know, the pain, the agony of, of being rejected as king. The truth comes out. Okay, I was afraid. I was afraid of the people. I was afraid of what they were going to say. So, so he's honest about it. And so Samuel. Saul says, now I beg you, forgive my sin and come back with me so that I may worship the Lord. But Samuel said to him, I will not go back with you. You rejected the word of the Lord, and the Lord has rejected you as king over Israel. So the truth comes out. He he was in obedience, and, and 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 God spoke to me about this that that he was afraid. Fear is the number one enemy. And I thought about all the fear of my life. The things that have kept me back was fear. It, it, it's fear, and, and I was afraid of public speaking. I was afraid of crossing over. I was afraid of, of buying a sober house. 
you know, because I didn't know. There's a lot of unknown, so I was afraid of the unknown. I was afraid of failure. I was afraid of many different things. And, and so if we're honest with ourselves, and, and, and you know that God's put his finger on some things, you know there's some things that God has called you to do in life. If you're honest with yourself, there's probably a fear behind that. And so as we look at, the, at, at, at Saul's life, um, a little further on in, in 1 Samuel 17, 11, it says, when Saul and all of Israel heard those words of the Philistines, they were dismayed and greatly afraid. So here's another instance where, where Saul was, was controlled by fear. He, he, he had a lifestyle being controlled by fear. In, in 1 Samuel 18, 11, it says, and he hurled it, saying to himself, I'll pin David to the wall. But David eluded him twice. Saul was afraid of David because the Lord was with David but had departed from Saul. And so not only was fear controlling his life, he had a spirit of fear on him. The, the Bible talks about fear being a spirit. In, in 2 Timothy 1.7, it says, For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and love and a sound mind. So, so the, the scripture describes fear as a spirit. It's a spirit that comes on us. It's a spirit that paralyzes us. It's a spirit that keeps us from advancing. This was a spirit that was on him, because you see it, you see it controlling his life, controlling his advancement, controlling um, him moving forward. When, when, when Goliath showed up on the scene, the enemy shows up, and, and the number one thing he did was fear and intimidation, fear and intimidation. Saul was paralyzed by fear. He was paralyzed by it. The thing about that story about David and Goliath, now uh, Goliath shows up. He installs fear. He intimidates them. He, he, he makes them second-guess themselves. He, he paralyzes them. He tells them that he reminds them of their past battles. He, he, he tells them, you know, are, aren't you just the Philistines? Are, you know, we're, we're the Philistines, and, and you're, you are just servants of Saul. And, and they were so much more than that. They were the army of the living God. So the enemy's tactic is to always get you to believe in these, these partial truths, these half-truths. And we always think he's a great deceiver, and he's always telling us lies. Now, he, he comes at us with truth. He wants us to buy into, into things that, that at surface level are true. Yeah, they were servants of Saul, but that's not what they identified. They were the army of the living God. And so the enemy will try to remind us of who we are. will try to get us to buy into these surface level things. Oh, you're no good. And say I failed yesterday. Say I was a complete failure, a terrible husband and a terrible father, and, and I failed. That would be right there. You, you, were, you were terrible yesterday. It's easy for me to buy in because I was. It's easy for me to believe that, that truth because it's, it was true. But I'm so much more than that. I'm so much more than that. I'm a child of God. I'm forgiven. I'm in God's army. And, and so we have to remind ourselves of these things so we can remind the enemy of these things. Now, we're not just servants of Saul, we're the army of the living God. And so, so the army was paralyzed, right? I'll let you clap. <laughs> it was really just an excuse to get a drink. So. Um, sometimes we're paralyzed by fear. And, and so Goliath shows up. For 40 days, they ran in fear. They, they showed up. They had, their, they had their gear on, and they're ready to fight. They had their swords, they had their helmets on, and they're, they're protected. They're ready to fight, right? And they ran for 40 days. And so before they even fought one second, they were paralyzed. And doesn't it remind me of, you know, myself sometimes? I show up, man, I look the part. I got the Bible under the arm. I got, the, I got this. You know, and I was defeated before I even started fighting because I was paralyzed by, by the tactics of the enemy. I was paralyzed by all these things. And so... The enemy's goal is to always keep us from advancing. You know, and then when we do advance, he's trying to get us tripped up, right? We just had a great event. A lot of people got saved. A lot of people got healed. And so the enemy wants to come and he wants to rob us. He wants to steal that, that joy. He wants to steal that victory. If he can't, if he can't change the end results, he's going to change your victory afterwards. He's, he wants to steal that from us. He wants to get us discouraged. He wants to get us down. And I have to protect myself from and you have to protect yourself from that. You have to keep your head up. You have to keep a testimony up. You have to fight for, for that new ground we've got. And so I think we see that happening. I, I, 
I feel that the enemy has tried to come in. He's tried to steal. He's tried to rob us of that thing. And so the thing about Saul's army is they never fought one second. They were defeated. And, 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 and then the enemy comes. He says, you know, well, uh, if you send a guy down, you know, we'll fight. You know, I, I'm Goliath. You send a guy down and, and we'll decide who gets, who gets what, who gets the, the, the plunder, who gets the control of this. And what Saul didn't realize is that he had such a spirit of fear on him that he allowed the enemy to dictate the terms of battle in his life. Why did he have to listen to Goliath? He didn't. He had the army of the living God. He could have gone down there into the valley with his army and killed Goliath. And, and so the, the plan of the enemy is to dictate the terms of battle in your life. You don't have to listen to the enemy's terms of battle. You don't have to give in to that. No. I am the army of the living God. I'm going to just go down there, get my best warriors, and we're going to kill you. And so he was so confused. He so bought into the spirit of fear and control. It kept him stuck. It kept him from being obedient to what God had for him. And we, we want to serve God within our comfort zone, right? Um, and, and we pretend that our sacrifice, you know, uh, is better than our obedience, right? I'm comfortable. And, and God, you know, my sacrifice is I come to church. You know, I read the Bible. And I, I do, I'm in children's ministry. And I do youth ministry. And I do this. And I, and I, and I do sorrow. And, you know, I want to pretend to the Lord and my sacrifice. Is what's valuable to have. You don't care about my sacrifice. God, he doesn't. He just doesn't. He cares about my obedience. Yeah. And, and, and if my sacrifice doesn't line up to my obedience, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. It's for nothing. And, and, but a lot of times we'll use that as our excuse yeah. to stay comfortable. I'm comfortable in that sound booth, right? Yeah. You know, yeah. we, 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 you know, I don't got to go pray for people. You know, and I get to stay, you know we, we hide behind our comfort zones. And so we have to be careful that we don't hide behind our sacrifice. There's fear of failure, right? And uh, number one type of fear, I think, is the fear of failure. I don't want to fall on my face. You know, I think it's, it's kept me from moving forward. I don't want to fail. Failure doesn't feel good, right? Failure is terrible, you know, or so we think. But what I've learned about failure in the last three years, it's the number one thing that I've learned my lessons in. I've learned through failure. Uh, failure implies that I'm trying. If I wasn't trying, I wouldn't be failing. And so we have to change our perspective on failure. Failure is my number, man. Failure is my best friend, man. The only thing that separates me from a guy that, that has been successful or, or hasn't made a recovery is I've just gotten up more times than he has. I've failed a million times. I've just gotten up a million and one times. I'm far from there. Um, but I know where I'm at. And I know um, that, that I need to continue to overcome these fears. So there's a fear of failure. You know, I, I had to address that fear when I bought a house. I didn't want to fail. You know, and a lot of the lessons I learned in 2020 came out of failure. It didn't feel good. You know, I wasn't being successful necessarily in, in, in the recovery home. I felt like I was failing all the time. Um, but was I really failing? You know, I bought a sober house to help guys. That's not a failure. You know, and what I've had to learn, what God has kind of had to show me in life is I had rather step out of the box. And I'd rather fail trying to live my dream then fail by not even trying. And, and so that's the crossroads I had to get to in life. I'd rather fail by, by, by stepping out of the boat like Peter did. You know, what, what, what sometimes is on, on, the, on the other side of fear? Sometimes it's just more fear. You know, there's this continual having to overcome. I thought when I opened a sober house, okay, I'm good. You know, I overcome that fear, right? Now I just opened Pandora's box of fear. You know, I have all these things that, that I've had to address within myself. You know, who's changed the most in two years of owning a sober house? Me. Because I've, I've had to deal with me. I've, 
had to address some things in my life. I had to overcome some fears. And, and, and so shortly after, God told me to go to start Facebook Live because meetings were shut down and, and people weren't able to get some of the things in. So I went live for a year. There's nothing like overcoming fear than looking at a computer, talking for a half hour, trying to, to give people something encouraging. Not only that, but you've got the, you know, the computer looks back at you. So now I'm like staring at myself talking for like hours. Of but, I, but I had to overcome some things with myself. I finally learned, I'm gonna put a, you know, I, I did, couldn't learn how to turn off the front camera, so I had to put a piece of paper over the screen so I didn't have to look at myself. It's hard to look at yourself and talk for a long time. Try to look in the mirror for a half hour and just talk to yourself. It's weird. It's weird. So I've, so I've had to learn to overcome some things in my life. I've had to learn to, to deal with that fear. And, 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 I, and I want to shut it down, you know, but, but God wants me to, to keep going. God wants me to continue Amen. to overcome myself and continue to be obedient. So fear of failure, number one. Uh, another fear that we face is fear of rejection. You know, I've been rejected before. I don't, I don't like the, the feeling of rejection. I don't like to be rejected. You know, that's the fear of, of, of the public speaking. Part of what God had shown me in going to Hope Haven is, is my reward structure changed. Now it didn't matter how well spoken I was. It doesn't matter if I had a home run. It doesn't matter how well I speak. I win when I walk through that door. The, the minute I walk in this door inside, I win. It doesn't matter how well spoken I am. So I stopped judging myself. I stopped judging my results. I stopped judging how well spoken I am. And, and, and my value is in obedience. My value is in, 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 and then I'm a lot looser. You know, I'm not wound so tight. I'm not so nervous. Although I was a little nervous this morning. But the, those those songs were for me this week. You know, what's that one? Your fear, uh, standing in your love. What's it say? Fear. My fear doesn't stand a chance while standing in your love. You know, and that really ministered to me this morning. And I feel like all three of those songs just, just spoke to some of those insecurities inside me. And um, and so I appreciate your, your obedience and hearing God and what songs to live for me this morning. Um, fear of rejection. I don't want to be rejected. And so we don't. We have that fear of being rejected again, that feeling of being rejected. So we have to overcome that. Uh, another fear, fear of what other people think. And I think if I'm honest with myself, that's what I was dealing with in public speaking and going to Hope Haven was was a fear of, of falling on my face and not being well spoken. So I'd over prepare. You know, I'd, I'd make sure that I wasn't going to fall on my face, that I had something to, to fall back on. So even my preparing was out of a fear. It was a fear of falling in my face. And, and, and there's a difference between doing things with excellence and, and doing things out of fear. And so I recognized some of those things in myself that I don't come that fear. Um, because I was afraid of what people thought. I was afraid of you know, ultimately being rejected. You know, and, 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 and I don't like that rejection in my life. So um, fear of the unknown. That's, that's, that's a common one. We want to have control, right? We like to know what is going to happen. I think that's just nature. We want to know. But there's that fear of the unknown. When you step out of the boat, when you step out the, yeah, I don't know how it's going to go. I don't know how things are going to be. I don't know. There's that fear of the unknown. And so um, underneath the fear of the unknown is that spirit of control. We try to control everything because because we don't know. And, and out of that fear of control really says, I'm not trusting God. I'm not trusting God with my life. I'm not trusting God with the outcome. I'm not so going to control it. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to dictate it all, you know, because I have control of it and then I know how it's going to end. And so we have to be careful with, with, with the fear of the unknown, that, that we're trusting God still, that we're still giving it to him, that I don't need to control it. And it's something that I've had to learn, uh, I think, the hard way. Fear of success. There's, that, that's an honest thing. There's a fear of success, especially in recovery. Uh, people start getting successful. Like it's, it's forward to them. You know, it falls under that fear of the unknown. They don't, they don't know what to do with it. You know, so they self-sabotage. They start to sabotage themselves, and, and, and it's uncomfortable work. I think the hard thing in recovery is having to look in the mirror and admit that I'm the problem. It's one of the hardest things I've had, ever had to do in my life, is I'm the problem. It's not anyone else's fault. And so there's that, uh, that, that pain that comes with that. It, there's a lot of unknowns with dealing with things. And so we want to go back to what's comfortable to us. Even if it's a destructive behavior, it's what we know. Uh, drinking alcohol, even though we know it's killing us, I'm comfortable there. 
I know that pain. I know what that pain gives me. Uh, I know what that hurt and that unforgiveness gives me. I'm, I'm, I'm comfortable there. And so we, we go back to what's comfortable. And, and, and if we're not careful, it'll, it'll hold us out of the will of God. Uh, fear of pain. I've gotten hurt once. I'm not going to get hurt again. And, and that's why Jesus tells us to love our enemies. Because really what he's trying to do is he's trying to get you to look at yourself. He's trying to get you to keep your heart right. Because if I'm not careful, I'll harden my heart. And, and I won't put myself out there again. One of the things I had to do when I accepted my assignment to help guys in recovery was I, I, I was in a, it was in a moment of extreme pain where I had just someone just died on me that I had helped. He was, a, he was the first guy I helped. He was clean for six months. He was living his life for the Lord. And I get a call. And they said, did you hear about Christian? And I said, no. He, they, they found him dead in the streets of Rochester. And that hurt and I remember sitting on, I was on vacation, I remember sitting on the beach and, and having that moment with the Lord that if I'm going to move forward, I'm going to help more people, there's going to be a lot more pain. It's going to hurt. Uh, a lot more people are going to die. People are going to hurt me. And, 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 and I had to accept that moving forward. And I have to continue to accept that assignment that, that I can't let my heart get hardened because I've been hurt. And so I have to protect myself. I have to go to bed praying for those that do me wrong. Because, I, because there's more people that need help. I have to keep my heart right, or I lose what's unique about myself. And one of my guys told me that, uh, you know, don't, don't lose what's unique about you. You can't let your heart get out. You can't, you can't go there because you'll lose what makes this place special. And that's your love for these guys. So, fear of loss. We, 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 we lost something before, so we don't want to lose something again. You know, you, you, you step out of a boat and say it was a fail. Say, say you did, you had a financial loss. I don't want to put myself out there again. I don't want to lose what I do have. And so um, our experience tells us uh, it puts up a wall of fear. Now, I lost something before. I don't want to lose something again. I, Lord, I stepped out there last time. I ain't going to do it again. And so we have to be careful that we don't let our past experience dictate our, our, our moving forward. Fear of being alone. I see a lot of people that um, they don't want to be alone, and so they they, they put themselves in, in relationships too fast. They they put themselves in a, in a position where um, they're in unhealthy relationships because they're afraid of being alone. And sometimes it's just because we don't want to deal with ourselves, and so we avoid that by by having somebody around us. So fear of being broke. I don't know. That's a real fear. I don't want to be broke. But I, I've seen that, um, even in my wife's life, that she's responsible. But some of her, um, how she's, she's, had to, she's had to loosen her hands because the, it really was a fear in her life. She didn't want to be broke, so she over-prepared. She, she had this, and then I came from. And I, did, and I, and I just I ruined that because, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm cut from a different thread. And so I, I've, I've had to help her, you know, as she was responsible. But, but she had a fear that was that was underneath that. It was, I'm afraid of being broke, so I'm going to over repair. And, and when we do that sometimes, our hands are so tight that we can't give. And we can't give to what God has told us to give. And, and so the, 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 one of the biggest tests is the test of giving. Am I going to give? Am I going to loosen my hand? Am I going to be obedient to what God has told me to? So what's on the other side of fear? And I talked about this when I started. On the other side of fear is your dreams, is your greatest accomplishments. Some, when I've overcome the fear in my life, on the other side of that fear was, was, was living my dream. I had a dream for 20 years of owning a sober house and helping guys. And, 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 and I'm living that dream because I overcame that fear. Some of the, the greatest accomplishments in my life were on the other side of fear. And so on the other side of fear, God has something for you. Your dreams are there. Your obedience is there. And so... In 2 Chronicles 16.9, it says, For the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth to give strong support to those whose heart is blameless toward him, whose heart is completely his. The eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth to give strong support to those who are blameless. I love that scripture. Because it implies that the creator of the universe, God himself, you know, who created everything, he says, it says he wants to strongly support me. Wow, that's, that's incredible to me. That, that, that God, who created everything, he wants to strongly support me. But it's conditional. It's conditional upon 
him having my heart. Upon my heart being completely his. And why is that? Because God can't back something that is compromised. Because then it gives off the wrong message to the world that he can, that he can back something that's in the world. Because then everyone will expect that. God backed you when your heart wasn't completely his. Now he'll back me. It's conditional. God, God can't strongly support us until my heart's completely his. Until I've chosen, okay, God, here I am. I'm going to overcome this fear. I'm going to overcome this pain. And so, Romans 5, 19. For just through the disobedience of the one man, the many were made sinners. So also through the obedience of the one man, the many will be made righteous. And I love this. Um, because it says through the disobedience of one, many were made sinners. So also through the obedience of one man, the many will be made righteous. Th th this says that, that your circle is affected by your obedience. Your circle will be affected by what you do in your life. And, and Betty, is she Betty here? Maybe her hand, Betty? Betty's not here. Betty was a sweet old lady who brought her husband last Sunday and was a part of the event. Her um, husband got hit by a car. The first night of the event, he's out there helping, got hit by a car, had to go in an ambulance and get taken away. So Betty was here last Sunday, and um, the, when I saw Betty the next night at the conference, she was out here, and she had just parked, and, and I felt the Lord um, move on me to accommodate her, to help her. And I didn't accommodate anybody during the thing. Um, I didn't try to, you know, I just, it wasn't what I was called to do, to accommodate. I felt to accommodate Betty. And so I, I waited and talked to Paul and Lee, and I said, hey, can I accommodate her? Can I find one lonely chair and put it up front for her? So I find her a chair, I get permission, find her a chair and I put her up front. And so that was our first healing night service, right? And, and Betty was the first person that Mario prayed for, that, that, that got her healed. She got not only five things in her body healed, but the six thing Amen. healed in her ears. And so my obedience was tied to her, her, her victory, Amen. to her healing. And so uh, had I not been obedient, and, and, and not only that, that testimony of Betty's healing has been all over the internet. If, if you follow Mario, you know, it, it's, it's been one of his capstone um, victories. It's showing that. And I've seen it four or five times. I've seen it, uh, the whole world has seen it, practically. You know, and that, that's how much that video is out there. And so we have to we have to know that um, my obedience uh, is other people's breakthrough. Amen. My obedience was her healing. Me being obedient to being sensitive to God's voice and doing that which He called me to do. Amen. Her healing flowed through that. And so we have to we have to know that that our obedience is tied to other people's healing. So obedience uh, it says that that many will be made righteous. And so it's not just about you. You know, it's not just about that overcoming that fear. God wants to use you. He wants to use you to affect other people's lives. He wants to use you uh, to change the world around us. So, so I'm going to open up. I thought David was there. He is. Hi, Dave. <laughs> Come on up, Dave. I want to invite our, our altar team up here today. Christine, Kathy, if you want to be up here, be in whichever one you prefer. If you could be up here, be great. Um, Alan, Dave West, uh, is, uh, Nancy. There's Nancy. Your husband as well. So, yeah. 